Yeah, it makes me feel cool. You look cool. <laughs> hey everyone, it's Wednesday again. Welcome to live fly tying <laughs> live from the Northern live. Angler here at the Northern. It's Saturday in... <laughs> night. I swear I'm gonna get Brian a soundboard with sound effects. <laughs> it's just gonna be fart I noises. Swear. You guys haven't seen it'll go Brock down Meyer so fast. <laughs> I asked, just asked Matt if he look feels like Joe Rogan with the headphones on. I think they could hear that actually. Right. I, I cued awesome. the mics on, so yeah, it's. We're super excited to have Ed McCoy it, so. in the yeah. house tonight, uh, tying up some game changers. This is one of the most popular uh, flight patterns that people come in to the I'm shop really and excited. ask about. I'm hoping so. to, to learn a few things about balancing and numbers of shanks and things like this. And uh, Ed has, uh, you can't see him yet because he's behind the curtain. And He is behind <laughs> the curtain. Uh, he is pointing at the yeah. game changer book. But before we get started, real quick, if you want to know about the materials, the list is in the link right down below in the description. If you're watching on your phone, think about getting the app that allows you to use the chat window. Um, and if you're watching on your TV, know that you can turn that off. Uh, I know we've had some issues in the past, of course. Use the chat window. Ed is here to answer your questions. We're going to have a ton of questions. I know that. Uh, Absolutely. And we'll take breaks as we go. We're just going to tie one fly, but there's a ton of detail here. So remember, you can go back and rewatch all these videos, plus the ones we've done in the past. So you can rewatch Russ Madden. You can rewatch Tommy Green with big pike tubes. That's that's why uh, we're doing it. It's yeah. uh, it's an awesome free format for all of you, and we really have fun doing it, uh, let's even get when we stress out. So <laughs> let's uh, introduce Ed here. Uh, now you can see him. You're on screen, Ed. Uh, welcome, hey, welcome. Ed. Thank you. It's nice to have uh, something fun like this when it's so stinking <laughs> cold outside. Right. Well, it is cold. Uh, oh my gosh! I don't know about you, but I'm kind of getting the winter blues. Yeah, yeah, I think trying Brian not. has a solution lined up for that, actually. Yeah, well, yeah what's Coming that? Saturday? Going to Mexico. <laughs> Saturday. He's out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, so. well, when we get past that part and start talking about stuff that's more relative to the rest of us. <laughs> oh, I'm there, too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Man, I wish I could go to Mexico. Um, yeah. So... Do you want to introduce Ed? So, yes. Ed McCoy is a guide. Uh, gosh, Ed and I met many, many years ago when he and Brian Burroughs were working yeah. uh, on the Pine River uh, during their college uh, work for um, Michigan, State. Michigan State. So, Ed has a degree in fisheries biology and zoology from Michigan State. He's a very... Um, you know, scientific approach to fly fishing. He's also one of the guides um, that I hire uh, as another guide to take me uh, musky fishing. So, um, you know, Ed's a great guy. I love to work around him on the on the river. Um, he's a, a really super polite person and, and just an all-around great guy. Plus, he's super fishy. Um, so, anyway, Ed, welcome. 
Thanks. Thanks Ed, for having me. Ed works with Mangle Fly, and maybe yep. just tell us a little bit about yourself, Ed. Well, so I grew up in Petoskey, Michigan, which isn't too far from here. Um, and basically graduated high school from there and went to uh, Michigan State and uh, kind of pursued a path towards science. And as I was going through school, kind of became obvious that opportunities in that field were pretty limited. And, uh, you know, it was a time when the state was being constrained and they were having early buyouts and not replacing positions. So I ended up going to grad school for a year, and while I was there, an opportunity uh, came about to start guiding, which was something that I always had on a bucket list of something to try. So I basically gave it like a five-year plan, jumped in two feet, sink or swim, and haven't looked back. And uh, coming up on my 20th year guiding full-time now. So, That's fantastic. Yep. Chasing the dream, living the dream, whatever they say. Well, I can't whatever. believe how long we've both been guiding. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. time. You know, and time time is flying by, so don't blink. You'll miss something. Absolutely. But Absolutely. So I know you've been fishing these game changers for a yep. long time. Yep. So it kind of piqued my interest more more in the musky realm, um, kind of seeing the design and start playing around with it a little bit and uh, – Fishing a little more seriously, and I'll be honest with you, I mean, when I saw it in a figure eight scenario, I was like, wow. I mean, how, I don't care if it does anything between the cast and the boat. <laughs> it looks pretty damn good right there in front of you. So, right. you know, for me, that was kind of like a huge sell for, for it. They're not the easiest fly to tie from a time-consuming thing. Um, I enjoy the process. Um you know, by no means do I consider any of these like my flies. You know, sure. these are variations of the platform, essentially. So, um, you know, they're fun to tie. They're fun to fish. You get sick of one, you just put on another variation and watch that one swim for a while. But then, you know, after fishing it a little bit for musky and seeing kind of like how effective it can be in certain situations, especially when you got a soft bite window, you know, like when fish are really not fired up, um, kind of started playing around with it for trout i mean let's face it streamer fishing for trout is <laughs> way more popular than when you and i started right i mean these fish Absolutely. are seeing a streamer just about every day of the year you know there really isn't a time somebody's not out there throwing them and for me as a guide it's really not the biggest part of my program at all right um you know the dry fly game is pretty much where i cut my teeth as far as guiding that's not to say that I don't enjoy streamer fishing for trout or any other species of fish, but, um, you know, for me, it's kind of like when I get those opportunities, it's a lot of fun. It's exciting. I'm not burned out on having done it for three straight weeks, right? You know, waiting for the next good bite window to appear. Um, cause let's just face it. They don't, it's not an everyday success story. You're going to sure. grind a lot of days out, catch one or two. There are a lot of days where you see a high volume of fish still only catch one or two. They're going to have those days which are a little less in number that, well, the fish basically commit suicide. Yeah. And you'll, you'll get a lot of opportunity. So you just have to grind through that slow time. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a chase. It's a hunt. It's a chase situation. I enjoy the hunt and the chase. You can't fish for muskies and not appreciate the days in a row of not even seeing a fish. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's face it. It's not. It's not the easiest fish to catch on a fly. It's very possible. It's feasible. We do get them, but um, they're, they definitely teach you a lot about patience as an angler. And uh, they're an exciting fish. So Absolutely. They're super fun. Yep. But anyway. I know. I got to go again. We didn't. I think yeah. we caught a pike when we went. We did. But, um, yeah, we had one of those days where Mike, did not want to Mike play. caught a pike. I did not. But. No. Oh, yep. He's a better angler. <laughs> well we had some pretty high winds that day too matt it's not oh, like we yeah. had easy conditions for fishing so it started off with bad luck with my the, the, my car, the car was dead yeah sorry, two hours guys. sorry two hours later getting there start that's all right I drove really fast <laughs> all right so should we jump in let's jump yeah. into some time yeah. all right so basically what what we're gonna do is we're gonna tie um, a feather changer on the micro changer platform and this one I kind of tied <clears throat> more or less to imitate uh, the lamprey that we start seeing in our rivers especially the upper manistee you know first part of May um, it's in that size range this thing is pretty sick in the water it moves a lot there's a uh, weight hidden in the head 
Um, I like to weight this fly. You can you can tie it unweighted if you want. Um, you can weight it with a pretty heavy cone. Uh, I've tied them with you know the one quarter inch cones. Uh, this one we're gonna do is with a three sixteenth, which I think is a little more manageable for a lot of that small pocket water that we're fishing up there. Um, the other one gets a little bit deeper, uh, and usually I'll fish that heavier version on a floating line with a long leader. What uh, weight rods are you using with something like um, this? You know, you can you can cast this lighter weighted one on a six weight, but honestly, I'm, I'm fishing a seven. It's just easier for most people to handle. Um, that way I can fish it on a sink tip too if I want to. Um, but, you know, you can throw it on a you know, pretty fast action six weight and a floating line with a longer leader um, and get it where you need to. So, you know, the thing with this platform is a lot of people tend to overfish these flies. You know, they're not designed to fish really fast. So one of the problems I had with the heavier weighted version on sink tips was I had it made me fish it faster because it's sinking quicker. So I lightened up the weight in it, got it kind of dialed into where I like the fall rate that I get with a sink tip, which allows me a little more versatility in the depth of water I can cover effectively. Um, game changers will get pretty deep. They'll get a lot deeper than most of your other flies, which is kind of, in some situations, a good thing. Sure. And I know so. that was one of the issues that I always have when I musky fish with you is I tend to overstrip the fly. I tend to work it yep. too quickly. And yep. then, you know, this year I just didn't give that fish the, the kill shot. I didn't listen to my guide <laughs> when he said, pause, stop man. the fly. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, he, that fish was about ready to run it over. <laughs> Took it away from him. It happens, Brian. It, happens. Uh, it happens still haunts me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, well, let's get started. This thing's pretty complicated from the situation of <laughs> we're tying on some pretty small shanks. So, um, and then basically we've got six of the six mil articulated micro spines that are we're going to run four in the rear and then we're going to run four of the eight hold mil. that right where the fly is actually and there we go perfect all right and then we've got a hook so this is, has nine articulation points in it so it's a pretty lengthy fly um i tried running it shorter and if i tie it bigger i will run you know like a shorter number of shanks in sequence you know something like six or seven as opposed to eight but it's you know, I wanted more leachy movement. And the longer that fly is, as it tapers down, the more movement you get in that rear, right? So it's the bulk in the front that makes the back swim and the combination of materials that you're using in this fly, which allows the water to flow over the material, which causes everything to kind of flow. So um, if you guys haven't gotten Blaine's book, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of good information in there. He talks a lot about um, combining certain materials and how they work together. And honestly, there's there's more information there you can consume in one reading. I mean, you'll look at it over and over and over. So uh, I read through it pretty good this weekend, obviously, or this winter. We've had a lot of cold weather lately. Not much to do except crank on the vice right. <laughs> and uh, whatnot. So anyway, well, let's get let's get after this thing. I'll pop this one out. And then we're going to basically get started. So... And that's the actual Rinzetti Game Changer. Yeah, these are the like Game Changer head, jaws. Yeah. With yep. the new uh, hook holder material clip, I believe. Yep. Yeah, I don't. you probably won't use that clip very much on this fly. <laughs> it's not long well, I told Ed before there, and I there's lost no, There's the... no stinger hook in this one either. It's a single hook fly. So, um, But basically what you want to do is go ahead and get four of your six mil shanks out. And we're going to just put the first one in the vise here. This will be the tail. These little guys are tiny, so don't make fun of me for wearing the specs, but it makes this a lot easier. Um, basically, we're going to use the brown thread. You can use any color thread you want. Um, you can create hot spots with this part of the fly. But I'm just going to keep it pretty neutral. So we're going to use a brown or an olive. This is just a 6 eye uni thread but uh, you can go heavier if you're having problems with your thread breaking I just don't like all the bulk I get with a heavier thread on these small shanks right, there we go so go ahead and put your shank in just start right behind the eye and we're gonna close up that gap and bring it all the way back 
to about the, where the bend starts on that thing. And then the first thing we're going to do is start with the tail. So we're going to use two different colors of marabou. Um, we're going to use a lighter undercolor, which will be a little bit shorter. And then we're going to use the MFC bugaboo. This stuff's actually UV, if you believe it or not. I'm not sure how they made all of UV, but it's pretty cool. First time I hit it with a UV light, I was like, whoa. So there's, there's a lot of things you can pay attention to with UV. We don't have enough time to go into that today. A lot of theories on it, but uh, it it's definitely great. has its place. If in people the are interested, world. we talked a lot about that with Johnny Ray, actually. Yeah. yeah, Johnny and I have a conversation probably about every other day on UV <laughs> stuff. And, you know, we see it in everything we fish for, you know, and we see it with musky, we see it in trout. I see it at night with trout. Um, I see it in the bass game, um, steelhead game. You know, there's a lot of different places that we we, we notice that there's some effective um, result that you get from fishing UV. All right. So basically just take a clump of this marabou and you can strip off pretty much the bottom half. We're not going to need it. And if you pull it forward and pinch it, and you're starting to get too many short tips in there, just strip off a little bit more. Really looking to use the top third half of this plume. And then we're just going to tie this right in. A couple loose wraps, get her cinched down. Oops, there we go, broke thread already. Man, it didn't take long. second here so if you pick this up and just kind of give it like a little half twist it'll tighten up that marabou and you can trim it a little tighter all right go in there and clean this up so our thread wraps don't come apart on us so after we get that tied in we're gonna add a little bit of flash you can add as much flash as you want here this fly I'm fishing a lot more in low clear water, winter time, um, early spring, before the big floods, and then again in May as we start to kind of get more dirty water on average, but there's still plenty of times when that water gets low and clear. And then this is just a copper flashaboo. I think this is a pearl opal, but you can use Anything copper, gold, it'll all look good with olive. So I'm just going to cut two strands, and we're going to wrap it around the thread, slide it up a little bit in front, and we're just going to pull two strands off to the right side, two off to the other side. We'll just kind of leave those for a second because we're going to trim them about the length of the next piece of marabou we're going to add in. So I'm just using the Alve Brown 2-inch uh, Bugger Boo. This is the mini stuff from MFC. Um, they make it in a bigger version too, but for these small flies, this stuff's perfect. Um, sometimes I have a hard time finding chunks that look good. All right. If you find one that's got a little bit longer fibers to it, it'll give you a little more action in that tail. So same process, you strip off the bottom, and we're going to tie this in just a little bit longer than the clump that we tied in before. And then right before I get to the back where the two kind of meet, I'm going to take my thumb and just kind of flatten that out a little bit, and that'll help of roll that marabou a little bit around the edges of that clump that we had underneath and then once you're done with that you can just trim this out take this forward towards the eye of that shank a little bit more make that transition with the feathers a little easier all right and if you get too much material in the front lighters are a great little trick for getting rid of that junk 
for hit the eye. All right. So now we can trim out our flash view. I'm just going to pull them back. Kind of about the length of that. All right. So now the tedious part. So we're going to use two feathers. I got an olive and a brown. And you can use any color combo that you want, guys. This is, you know, the options are limitless. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of each color and we're going to blend this fly as we work our way forward. So in each shank, I'm going to reverse the order at which I tie these in. So in this one, I'm going to go brown, brown on top of olive. That'll give me more of a brown hue. Next one, you get the point. So the other thing to consider here too is this is where you're starting your taper for the whole fly. You get funny comments already, Brian? What's that? I was laughing at Matt eating this meat stick. <laughs> <laughs> now I know why my daughter says, don't eat it in my ear, Dad. You chew loudly. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> So you want to try and get two of the smallest feathers you can off the base of this saddle. And we're going to tie them in by the tips. And this is where it pays to have the good quality feathers. So what we're going to do now is just kind of stack the olive on top, or the brown on top of the olive for this section. And if you just kind of grab it by the tip, we're going to pull these fibers back. And that will help give us a tie-in point. And I'm just going to go ahead and nip that off a little bit. I'm just going to tie them in right on top. And I'm just looking to get two or three turns with these feathers. I'm not trying to add a lot of bulk right here. This is just creating a knuckle or collar, if you want to call it that. Just be careful on your first two turns so you don't break the feathers. And with each turn, I'm just kind of brushing back those fibers, trying to get them to lay back like a wet fly. Just tie this off. Trim those out. A little whip finish and some glue. where those UV resins come in handy. Get that soak in a little bit. If you got any stray fibers, just grab your lighter again. Get rid of them. Okay, so we're done with that part. So now what we want to do is pop in our next shank before we pull this out of the vise. Um, let's see, somewhere up here I had a bakken. If I can find it. I'm sure I buried it. Oh, there it is, right in front of me. All right, so this, these little shanks are pretty tedious to work with. So if you put your bakken in there and take your thumbnail, you see that, Matt? And you can see how it'll open it up a little bit for you. So I just go ahead and put it right in there. And we're going to 
take this right out of voice. And put it into the next shank. Just like so. Okay. So basically from this point forward, we're gonna have a lot of repetition. Now we're gonna use a filler, which in this case, we're just gonna use chocolates, um, finesse chenille. This stuff's pretty slick. Um, I don't really like the filler flash. I think it's too dense. I'm um, really looking for a sleek, kind of a lot more flutter in the fly. And if you don't trim the stuff, it does move a little bit in the current. So we wanna use this three quarter inch stuff to begin this fly with and we're gonna as we get into the eight mil we'll jump to the next size up the one and a half I think it is I'm just gonna cut out a section so I don't have to deal with all this all right let's see where that went <laughs> getting too much stuff up here all right, so if you take this stuff and just kind of strip off the end and get a little bit exposed. Repeat. So we're going to start by putting our thread on the shank, closing that gap. We're going to take it all the way back into the bend just a little bit. This will help eliminate any gaps between the shanks when we tie in our materials. And we'll tie in our filler flash. I'm going to wrap up on the hump of that shank just a little bit. Give myself as much space as possible. Now on these smaller shanks in the back, we're just going to try and get one, one and a half turns. We don't need a lot. We'll just go with one turn on this first one. Tie it off. Now if you pull up and back on this brush, you can give yourself a little more space here. We're just going to wrap back over that just a little bit. All right, for the next step, we're going to add basically a mohawk or a tent of marabou over the top. I tie this fly without it. I mean, it moves good, but you add this marabou and it's got a whole other level of movement in the fly. It actually looks pretty good. So for this first clump, we don't need a ton. So we're just going to take essentially the tip of this marabou. And tie this in. And we want to extend just a little bit past our filler flash. Maybe close to the same length. And just tie it in right on top. couple of wraps here trim that excess out now before I go and add my feathers I'm gonna try and get in here with my thumbnail and roll those fibers out a little bit flatten them I'll help kind of create a larger back on the fly if you will all right so on the first one, we went brown on top of olive, so now we're going to reverse it. And then we want feathers that are slightly bigger than the last ones. So the idea is each time you add material, it should start to extend three quarters of the way into the next shank, right? We don't want to cover the, the shank, but we want to kind of creep. So each shank is going to get progressively bigger and bigger and bigger.
How long did it take you to figure all of those proportions out, Ed? Oh, the taper is an eye thing, man. I mean, it it took a while. I won't lie. There's <laughs> there was multiple flies that I tied and just yeah, whatever. <laughs> Scrap it later and start over. Reuse the materials. Um, you know, and I mean, even this last couple of weeks, you know, I tied quite a few of these, and uh, you know, there's one or two where you get done and you're like, eh, I didn't quite get it right. But it you really shows up in the water. So my my probably biggest suggestion with somebody that's just getting started tying this style of a fly is essentially tie one and then go swim it before you tie another one and look at it, you know, see how it moves, and you'll see where you're you're off with that taper. It won't, it's not, uh, it's not really hard to find. And sometimes it may be just as simple as adding another shank or, you know, using a little smaller feather or um, trimming your, uh, your underbrush before you put the feathers on to shorten that gap up. You know, this fly, I don't really need to do that too much because it'll flow together pretty easy because it's such a small bug. But as you start to get bigger in size, um, that's where it gets harder. All right, so we're just gonna reverse the order. Now we're gonna go olive on top of brown. Kind of the same tactic here. Get a little triangle started, pull the fibers back, and nip that off. It's got a little clean tying point. If I can get two or three turns on here, that should be good enough. I recommend you whip finish your shank before you do anything with that lighter. <laughs> Is that flow? Yeah, that's the flow. This is the yeah. thinnest version. Yeah. I'm really just trying to let it get saturated into the thread wraps just a little bit. All right, so now we're just going to kind of repeat this process as we move forward for a while. Oh, there goes one shank on the floor. <laughs> okay. How much would you say the, having just the right materials here just makes... A difference here. Oh, He's, huge, huge difference. I can imagine trying to tie this with regular strung rooster and strung marabou, and just man, that's yeah. No, it's it makes a huge difference. And you know, I've I've tried using you know essentially cheaper feathers, and you know, I end up going back to buying the whitings just just because they're easier to work with, and it's more consistency too. So you know, and yeah, you're spending less time looking for the right size oh feather, exactly right? you know and with the bigger flies you spend five ten minutes just trying to find two that are to the right you know, size. big enough to <laughs> fill the gap that you have all right so yeah, these are flies you're gonna row back upstream to get if oh, yeah. <laughs> they didn't yeah. <laughs> well, i will say we do sell these at the shop and people <laughs> look at that price tag and i'm like have you ever tried one yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's money well spent no nope. There's a reason why they cost what they do. Yeah. All right, so let's try and get one more half turn on this next shank if we can. Did you fish with Blaine last year? Um, I did. It was uh, January. I went with a customer of mine, 
and we had terrible water conditions. And uh, he basically told us not to come, but you know, tickets were already paid for. We're like, we're coming, dude. So find something for us to do. You know, he worked his ass off. He did a great job. Um, not his fault. Fishing was right. tough, but what do you do? You're not better than the conditions you're dealt. You know, so we've all just deal there. with it. And uh, yeah, I lost a very large muskie that I still have nightmares about. I didn't get the look that my customer Bob and Blaine had at it, but both of them were saying 53, 54. Whoa. And I can tell you about how much that SA line was stretched out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was all of that. So, All right. You can either reuse some of this marabou from the last clump that you butchered, or you can take a whole new piece and nip it off at the tip. But I'm going to recycle some of this stuff. So I'm going to get just a little bit more marabou than what I had in the last clump. Before we tie that in, pull out any really long strands here. All right. So this, we're just gonna tie it in a little bit longer. So it goes just about where the other clump of marabou ends on the shank behind it. Tie this in a little bit here. And then same process, roll your thumbnail over the top, kind of splay that out a little bit. And we're gonna find two more feathers a little bit further up on the saddle. While you're picking through feathers there, Ed, yep. we're going to throw some questions at you okay. from uh, Eastern Fly asks, have you tried tying these with nothing but synthetics? Um, not this small. I have not. Um, basically, I'm fishing these for trout. So one thing I've noticed with like the whole game changer thing, a lot of the full synthetic versions, I don't have as much success in our waters for trout. I just don't. And I think it's just that undulation that's not in the material. And that's why I use a lot more natural materials in my trout versions. Now, as I get bigger, you know, like I tied one last week that I brought as an example to show later, you know, this is fully synthetic. This fly is kind of like his hybrid version, I guess you would call it. But it's got a synthetic, two synth different, three different synthetic brushes, one at the head, um, one for fill, and one for the collar. Um, you know, and th this fly moves really well and I've caught trout on it, but I would still probably opt for the feather choice over this if I had to just grab one out of the box and start with it. So I think that the movement that you get out of that feather and how the trout respond to it and behave to it is, is worth the extra effort you have to put into tying it. So, and I can see, you know, just going a little too far with, with, uh, synthetics being, an issue too yeah and it's it you know and it's harder to get it leaner right you get right. a lot exactly. of bulk really quick and if you're not careful by the time you get done you're like ooh, it's like <laughs> it doesn't look fast right. food yeah yeah <laughs> blimpy on a hook that's why i didn't have wendy's tonight you left with the intention i did you did i, I was I, get, I went to subway i gotta eat fresh <laughs> keep it fresh man Brian's shopping for an endorsement <laughs> yeah, right. for, the, for, for the live fly time. <laughs> uh, All right, we're almost done. We'll with take these. foot longs if I mean. <laughs> Absolutely. Almost done with the tiny shank. It's a huge difference when you jump from the six to the eight on this. All right, we'll wrap this forward two or three times. Just kind of stroke these fibers back as we go.
Now, if you're choosing feathers and you're not certain, like, man, I don't know, that might be too big. There's nothing wrong with kind of pulling one out, putting it up on the shank, and giving it a roll to see where the fibers end up. You know, that I do that a lot on those bigger ones. It takes me a little longer time, but I also know that each gap as I progress forward on a bigger fly gets magnified at a greater magnitude, right? So it's a little bit harder to see it with a naked eye. There's nothing wrong with cheating. If you don't care, you just cut and go. All right. six mil shank as I dumped one on the ground somewhere. Yeah, these do not come with a magnet. Uh, it no. might be a good thing to have. Yeah. Or like one of those All magnetic those park little cups. Little magnets that you get in your like um, hook packs. Hook packs. I save some of those. I just Absolutely. I keep them around for this exact reason. Yeah. I should have brought one with me. I forgot. But it's a great way to kind of keep your stuff from sliding off your pedestal or off your tying table and then the other thing is don't push too hard on these shanks like i did in that last one because it'll it'll spring right off of there if you're not careful you'll shoot your eye out kid yes don't want to do that did you see that somebody uh used gorilla glue in their hair and is trying to formulate a lawsuit I saw that. Oh. I don't think you can what? come up with a lawsuit because you're that. Well, it does not say on the label that it is not intended for hair use. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Anyway. Oh, my. Huh. So I shouldn't drink gasoline and try and sue somebody. Cause... No. You... <laughs> Probably not a good idea, Brian. Hey, you, look, guys didn't, uh, you guys didn't blast some bleach in? Can, can you read this glass months? here, Eddie? It says, stupid ought to hurt. Yes. That's uh. <laughs> It's our friends over at Backcountry North with probably the best slogan. It's a around. great it's slogan. It's so good. I don't disagree. My wife always says you can't fix stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Repeat this process one more time. still the same size yep. with. yeah i'm gonna change size once i hit the next shank on this next one here when we jump to the eight mil go to the next size up and you notice i didn't put this in on the tail before the feathers i wanted less bulk back there right so that we get that taper Is that a trial and error thing? Did you start off doing yeah, it? Yeah, and actually, Blaine talks about it in his book a little bit too. But uh, yeah, it's more trial and error. I was actually, when I first started tying these, I mean, it's really hard if you just look at a picture to go, okay, he's doing this, 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 and this. So, you know, like the marabou was a separate shank, and then I'd do the next one. And I just saw kind of like over time, like, no, oh, he's, you know, cheating he's using a longer shank in there ah good idea so it saves a step all right so we need some marabou again here where'd my package go so i want just a little bit more than the last one obviously we're starting to get a little bit bigger here in the profile gonna line that up so it goes just about back to the tips of the last clump. Just make 
using the thread monster roll off on this one, but here we are. All right. We you talk a little bit about uh, lampreys as a as a food source for trout. I mean, I know we're that's kind of what we're yep. shooting for tonight. So, just, I know John has written a killer article over on Mangled Fly too about that with good I, pictures I too. Wrote that. Oh, oh I'm wrote, sorry. I'm sorry. 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 Tell us about your Ooh. article, Ed. Yeah. Well, I wish I'd read it before I came. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, chestnut lamprey are actually, if you look at it from like a statewide population, um, they are more abundant in the upper Manistee than anywhere else in the state. So as we get into May, um, water temperatures really dictate their activity level. And... 50 degrees seems to be somewhere between 50 and 55 degrees. Their activity level really kicks up, and they start feeding. Well, they're a parasite, right? They're an ectoparasite, so they attach to fish similar to, like, sea lamprey would. They're actually a native species. Um, but they're, you know, it's not uncommon to catch a trout that has, well, Two, I've three. seen as many as 11, 13 yeah. on one Whoa. trout. One fish. Really? You know, it's a sizable trout, but, yeah, so they're, they're in high abundance. They primarily are active at night, <laughs> excuse me, at night. And, um, you know, and these fish, they understand what they are. They don't like them. And they will lash out at these things, especially if you throw, you know, anything leachy, really. But, um, you know, I had a day last year with a customer with this exact fly we're tying now. I don't know how many big fish we moved. I mean, it was just a sunny day. They didn't want to bite, but, man, we were having opportunities, right? And we had some really cool visuals where some pretty nice sized trout came out and basically chased it out of the hole. You get a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of refusals when, when they, that lamprey function kind of kicks in too, but uh, they will eat them. You know, I haven't seen too many of that have coughed one up, but you know, they eat worms too, right? So, right, right. but yeah, the, the lamprey thing's huge for us. We had a fish at one point that had so many lamprey on it and we caught it coming it was at night we caught it and it looked like we called it medusa yeah because <laughs> it had so many lamprey on it was a big fish and hey did you get medusa because i don't know you know you put those fish in the net and all the lamprey pop off but then you can catch that fish you know a few weeks later or whatever and it's got three Scars or four and... on them and, and still scarred up so <laughs> man they must be pretty aggressive yeah they're not bashful in you know in those trout like i said they recognize that you know, that is a threat, or I'm not sure if they really look at it as a, a food source, but they definitely recognize it as a threat, I believe. And, you know, it's a reactionary bite, I think. But they, they definitely will, <laughs> you know, that's why the circus peanut works so damn well up there. It's just, right. you know, Russ, Russ designed a really good fly that was really good at getting these bigger fish fired up. And... You know, essentially anything leachy, that's essentially what we're imitating up there. Alright. Do those chestnut lampreys, do they spawn in the spring? Um, kind of in late summer, early fall. Okay. And I've actually caught fish in the Hoden Pile section with them. Um, uh, attached to a fish in February. It's the only one I've ever caught that way. But so some of them will hold. Like usually they'll they'll emerge sometime in the winter time, and they'll go through a metamorphosis, and they become a filter. They go from a filter feeding organism to the parasitic phase, right? And they come out of the mud where they burrow, and they become a free swimming organism at that point. Um, pretty much for. I forget what the lifespan is in the larval stage. I think with a chestnut, it's three to five years. I'd have to look it up again. But, you know, they spend that time basically in the sediments, and they're not available as food to a trout. Um, so when they become 
parasitic and they go through that metamorphosis, that's when they become available. And most time they're, you know, four, five inches maybe. But they grow pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, most of the fish I've caught with them in June, early June, mid June. I mean, a lot of these chestnuts now are pushing five, six, seven inches they're long. Big. Yeah. You know, they're reaching adult size. And then they'll spawn in early fall. And some of them will die. Some of them won't spawn in fall. They'll hold over and spawn in, you know, late summer. So it's usually sometime between July and I think late October is typically when they'd be spawning. So there's a couple of good articles out there if you want to go looking for them. Yeah, that would um, be, I should check that out. We will try and uh, link Ed's article in the video and the uh, yes, materials did. list yeah. Johnny as well. It. He did all the all the legwork adding pictures and everything so co-authored how about that it's teamwork he's a producer <laughs> teamwork is dream work that's Great. what we like to say here and we're getting into the <laughs> legitimate science stuff tonight it's kind of well you know nice. take advantage of ed's vast knowledge when it's it comes nice. to uh insects and yeah lamprey that's why you ask I have people a plethora questions. of trivial information <laughs> lodged in my brain <laughs> So uh, keep using that chat window, everybody. There's, you know, <laughs> hurdle some questions at us. We always, we will filter through the appropriate ones. So, uh, but don't get any crazy ideas. Preferably softballs. <laughs> yes. Give us low hanging curve. No one's, uh, no one has commented yet. So, and we're approaching uh, 52 minutes. So. Right on. All right. Well, we're about to. We'll switch. see if people notice or, or not. Switch to the eight mil shank now. So, moving right along. All right. So now on this one, we're going to switch to that bigger filler flash, the next size up. Which is the one and one quarter. The finesse chenille. So now that we have a little more room to work with, um, kind of is a guide. It's like a two thirds fill, one third feather, right? So we're gonna probably get like two and a half to three turns on this first one, and then three to four turns of filler on these shanks as we move forward. some marabou again over the top wow that's noticeably larger yeah i'm like super excited now we're past that <laughs> <laughs> micro stage micro stage On any of these transition shanks, it's probably a good idea to kind of gauge your feathers actually on the shank. 
usually when you start making that transition is where you'll start seeing your gaps if you don't get it quite right. So I'll show you what I like to do and that's just kind of cheat a little bit. We'll just take the feather near the base, put it on there and see how far it extends into the material. A little big, we'll go a little bit lower. a little better. All right. Switch the orientation, the olive over the brown again. Uh, Jethro is the winner probably for for being the first person to comment about your uh, thread direction what, there. What's the over under? Uh, what did we say? We that? did not come up yeah. with an over under for that. Did we? How long did it take? Uh, Fifty six minutes. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> Stealth tying right there. So we 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 finally got. Hopefully a the lighting's okay. People can see it. <laughs> so one of the things that we were commenting about, Ed does. He ties backwards, so he wraps his thread towards him, whereas you know most people wrap the thread away from. Sure, it's just him. like if you guys saw that movie *Tenant* by Christopher Nolan, where people have to go backward. No, I'm just. Well, I didn't see it. <laughs> you didn't see it? Oh, it's... Well, I watched it this weekend. Was it free? No. Then I didn't I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too cheap. It was crazy. Once they add in time travel. It was gone. I could handle the backwards through. Yeah. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, all right. right. <laughs> no, you might want to fill me in. <laughs> I don't, that's a whole nother episode. I Absolutely. Think. And maybe two or three more. So it's just the way Ed prefers to tie. And um, no formal training. I just kind of went. Just kind of go uh, with your gut. It seems to work out for you. Um, so we, we did have another question about fishing, um, like when it comes to lampreys and stuff, Ed. Um, so one of them was, do you use this sort of strategy on streams that get lampreside? You could. Great, great question. Which yeah, is a absolutely. great question. I would definitely, you know, like this year they treated the PM. Um, I think I was down there two days post-treatment. Um, you know, if you... The, hard, the hardest thing about that is there's such a biomass of lamprey floating down the river, and the TFM actually does kind of turn the fish off a little bit sure to some it does. degree. We've all seen that. Yeah, the watercolor is nasty. Green, it's I don't think terrible. you really want to be touching it with your skin. I don't even want to get in it. Um, so, you know, I tend to find out when those treatments are and just avoid that yeah. river altogether when it happens. I usually bottle it up and make Kool Aid for the kids I don't like. <laughs> yeah. That's evil. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're not making them eat Tide Pods that's right no we were kids you used to take the water out of the back of the toilet and make Kool-Aid out of it <laughs> and then you tell your kids you didn't like in the neighborhood dude you're drinking toilet water <laughs> you're evil bro <laughs> but yeah I mean this would be a great you know fly to fish during that time frame but like I said you kind of miss your window you know you kind of the treatment kind of screws you basically it does so you're you know essentially you're fishing when these things are dying and drifting down the river but the fish really aren't that eager to eat because they're kind of messed up right and then by the time you get back to normal water conditions well now the fish have already kind of gorged on them so it's kind of like if you can time it right which is going to be a very narrow window yeah you could probably destroy um during that treatment but you know, like I said, I tend to avoid avoid the streams when they're putting that stuff in. Sure, and we have another good question. Oh. Um, are there any color va variations that you uh, tend to go to seasonally? That is from Murph Get Skunked a Lot. This is his uh, YouTube name, <laughs> great YouTube name. That is a great <laughs> YouTube name. Yeah, so, you know, water temperature does dictate how fish see color. Uh, interesting tidbit there. Um I think it has a lot to do with how the eye actually hardens. Um, 
obviously water temp as it gets colder it gets more dense right so it has it does have an impact on how fish perceive color um i don't think they fully understand it but they do they do make there's a study out there that i read that basically said that if you're gonna do any any visual temperature or temperature any visual color um, studies with fish you have to maintain the same water temp throughout all your trials otherwise it's skewed because it does impact the structure of the eye and how it perceives so you know for me it's always hard to kind of wrap your head around the concept of like okay what does the fish see like how do you know you know like what how do you explain it so trial and error right um obviously for me like low clear water winter time black i'm going black i'm gonna start with black i always do and if black doesn't work white why white? Well, if you look at a lot of fish species, when water temps are cold, they tend to look white. They're bleached. Their colors aren't popping. You know, look at a brown trout when it's colder. Sure. They're not that vibrant, deep yellow hue, are they? You know, you don't. You see that more in late May into June, at least on the streams that we're fishing. Um, so there is something there that you know kind of goes with that. But uh, dirty water, I love yellow, high vis stuff, chartreuse, white. Um, you know, black is still gives you a great silhouette, um, even in dirty water. But, you know, low clear water times, probably going to look at more natural stuff like this. This olive one. Russ talks a lot about matching the bottom with your bait fish patterns. Um, got a question. Sorry, kinda... I mixed some names up. That was a question from Rivers East Fly Fishing, my bad, Murph. Uh, Murph actually asked kind of a, a different question. Uh, let's see. What are some good patterns to Maybe match the hatch? Brian can answer that late one, March, too. Late ties if we uh, On the Either Manistee way. by yeah. Tippy Dam. Uh, I think there's only one hatch that you really have to worry about late March, and that would be the same if I hatch. <laughs> yep. So anything white. Uh, you know, maybe some stoneflies, too. But um, And probably not. I mean, we're talking but smaller. Salmon I mean, we're not talking yeah, big streamers so. here. Right. No, but Not that like color scheme. Yeah, exactly. Don't forget your egg buffet. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. And don't Keep forget the simple. egg hatch. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah. Even the trout are going to want that, not just the they steel. Are. So, yeah. yeah, that, that Alvin thing really takes off here as soon as we warm up. Yep. You know, like it should be going on now. It'll be popping. But they'll start hatching. Now. <laughs> getting getting more active in those gravel humps, and, you know, those fish will key in on them. So, all right. So we're moving forward. Essentially, you want to basically add a little bit mar marabou. And we did in the last clump. So, as you taper this fly forward with your feathers, don't worry about your feathers reaching past this marabou at this point because that that's going to progressively get longer and longer and longer. And um, I'm looking at the feather on the shank behind it. I want my feather that I tie in now to go you know, at least three quarters of the way to the ends of the previous shank, right? And that's kind of how I'm gauging my taper. The marabou, when this gets wet, it's going to just kind of flush out anyway. And it actually gives you a really sweet kind of undulating motion on the top of that fly. And when you put it in the water, you know, these things are... You know, we talked about what pausing the fly. Mm -hmm. You kind of had that fish coming hard at you, and we didn't stop it. Right. <laughs> so one, the one cool thing about this platform is that when these flies stop, especially in moving water, they're still moving, right? right? So longer pause. It's amazing how much these flies move. And it really doesn't take much effort to animate these flies, which is another reason why I like this platform, especially with customers. I mean. Is a guide, what's the number one problem you have when you're streamer fishing? Can't get to move the fly. Right. If we're not moving it, you know, the fish aren't responding to it, right? So getting that animation is critical. And if you can't achieve it, then, you know, why not cheat a little bit? Sure. Do you find that you get greater animation um, with a sinking line or a floating line with these um, particular flies? Well, this one, because weighted in the front, you know, Probably the floating line, honestly. Right. Especially if you you beef up the weight that you know that I'm gonna put on here. If you go to that next that one quarter inch cone on this little 
four inch fly, it's really going to drop. And for me in cold water, I mean, that's something else you can talk about. If you're not fishing a weighted fly, you're missing opportunity. Right. Absolutely. It's not the, not the time the water for swim temps, flies and jigging, yeah. jigging your flies is way more productive than anything that's going to be neutrally buoyant and, you know, fishing hard, walk the dog, whatever, you know, you're going to have way more success overall. Not to say that you're not going to get a bigger fish maybe on a, you know, a neutrally buoyant fly in the cold weather, but I see far more fish caught on weighted stuff than I do anything else. Oh, sure. And then once we start getting up in that upper 40s, 50 degree water temp, then those fish are starting to get, you know, pretty lively and they're willing to charge harder and and attack bigger stuff and that movement where you get more of that side to side action becomes more critical but early on in the season i think you know if you're not jigging you're you're missing opportunity absolutely weighted flies make a difference that time of year awesome amount of questions coming in now thanks everybody for using that chat window <laughs> Let's see. Oh, we'll go, go oh, back to uh, go back to our friend Justin, who in his spare time is a stunt driver. So. He is a stunt <laughs> driver. Uh, he jumped a UPS truck 18 feet in the air. Wow! And lived, and didn't, and then it, finished his route. And finished his route that same day. <laughs> nice. He's a legend. He is what a can we legend. Say? Uh, he's asking about. Um, Fish and game changers in rivers versus lakes. And what kind of uh, different effectiveness do you find? And I'll throw in there, too, do you change how you fish them in these two different bodies of water? I mean, obviously, you have current to deal with in rivers mm-hmm. most of the time, but uh, I'll throw that up for you. I mean, absolutely. I think you're fishing it different, right? So what's the number one constraint in a lake? Depth. All right, so, you know, you have, what do you have to do to achieve more depth? Either weight your fly or fish a heavier sink tip, right? So when I fish for muskies in lakes, I'm not really worried about getting way down, but I want to get down a little bit, right? So um, I'm probably fishing that fly a lot slower, with longer pauses, and a lot more smaller twitch action meaning you know like a slower long pull trying to get it to swim and uh with just enough energy maybe it'll kick left or right at the end a lot of that has to do with fly design too like how how you bulk up the front what material you're using up there so yeah i think the uh, the limiting factor you have in a river is still depth but now you have current so pace of current how fast is the water right so i find that for me, I don't think these flies fish as well in really boily, hydraulic fast water. They just mm-hmm. they just don't. It kills the action on them. So, like, the lower manistee below tippy. There's there's a lot of big, boily water in there. And there's just a lot of times where I'm fishing, I'm just like, eh, it's not behaving right in here. And I'll take it off, put something else on. But come back to it later when I get into a more, you know, laminar, even flow situation, then it's fishing again. So, you got to watch the fly and kind of pay attention to how it behaves. You know, I think that's number one thing a lot of people don't do when they're streamer fishing. They just go, 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 go. I'm always fishing the fly. I want, I want, if I can't see it, I can envision what it's doing because I've already practiced with something that I can see, right? So you get kind of a feel for what it is. And then you develop over time, like trial and error, you figure out, okay, well, this retreat works really good in this situation or but there's still those, you know, fish that make you have to come up with some new move at the end to Absolutely. seal the deal. You know, I can think of one that I had a big fish come out chasing a, a circus peanut one time. And he came right up on the shallow sandbar and then turned around, went back to the deep. And I just let the fly sink and then I just get one hard pop. It was like a last ditch effort and a big plume of sand kicked up. That fish turned around, came blasting through there and smoked it. Why? He was just nose on the fly like two seconds ago. You know, so, you know, there's really no written rule per se, but I think you have to be pretty plastic in your approach and adaptive, change a lot, you know, Mm -hmm. change size, change color. And, you know, I'm also looking for different actions in different situations. And if I'm not getting it, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm searching for that fly that'll, that'll do it. And 
yeah, your limitations, you know, with these flies are simply hydraulic. These things get deeper in my opinion, so I'm not afraid to fish them in deep water. I, I, I think they're far more effective because they do get deep. If you just let them fall, look over the floor. You know, with all the weight from the shanks and the hooks that you're using and the materials, how they're sparse and a lot of synthetics included in there, it allows water into the material better. So they do, they get deep. That's a good point. It's something that I've overlooked in the past too is, you you know, it looks like such a, on first glance, such a dense fly, you'd think, gosh, that's not going to sink. But all that extra weight, you got shanks all the way through it. It's a balanced weight too a lot of times if you're not adding a ton of weight up at the front and then... Like mm-hmm. Ed said, you get good penetration with water soaking into those materials because there's gaps. So cool answer. Great question from Justin. Uh, sum it up. Yes, fish them in lakes too. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, in a lake situation, the uh, variability of retrieve that you can do with these things is definitely an advantage. Two more segments here, and we're going to move on to the hook. small one out of there before I tie it in by accident. Risky take with a lighter thread. More questions coming in there, Matt. Kill the time. <laughs> Tons of questions, but we don't want to you know, impede your progress too much oh, here either. We can multitask. So what's your favorite sink tip, and uh, how do you adjust your leader length for condition and flies? Ooh, that's a, that's a great good question. question. I, I like the attention to detail about leader. I think too many people just jump right into the the sink tip and don't think about the next step i think you have to also consider what's your goal with the fly that you're fishing right is it to achieve depth 
or is it to elicit more action? So I tend to find that I will fish a longer leader with neutrally buoyant flies than I will with a weighted fly, right? Because I want, I know that fly is only going to get so deep, no matter, I could let my sink tip go to the floor and that fly may only suspend, it will still suspend five feet above the bottom, right? Right. Even though I'm dredging the bottom. And then on the first two pulls, you're not really bringing your fly down that much more. You know, it's going to come down a little bit, but then it's going to even out. And then as you get closer to the rod tip, it comes back it's up. coming back up, right? So I'm not necessarily worried about achieving depth on that one. So for me, I'm not going to run a 10-foot leader, but I might extend it out like five-ish, you know? So if I'm running a neutrally buoyant fly, usually in my boat, I'm grabbing a tippet spool, and I'm going like this. What was that, about five, five, five and, and a half, half feet? feet. Yep. Right? And then that's my leader length. Five and a half feet. That's I, have feet yeah. I have long arms. I'm arms. only 5'11", man, so... I just have monkey arms. This is at least six. Um, but if I'm running, you know, like a weighted fly, <laughs> like a cone head something, then I'm probably going for my chest to here, which is closer to three, three and a half feet. So right. it's it's quite a bit shorter. Not a lot, but, you know, you could go six, and it probably isn't going to do much as far as how it fishes, but may, maybe give you a little more action. But, um, you know, the cold water lines and the, the hover lines, those are all great. Um, anytime you can get something with an intermediate behind that sink tip, you're going to achieve greater depth. Um, and you get rid of that hinge. Mm-hmm. That hinge is what allows, that keeps your fly from staying in that zone that you want to fish it at long enough, right? So when you go from a floating connection to that sink tip, you're only in whatever desired depth zone that you're in for three, four, five strips. And, you know, a 15 strip retrieve, you're back to the boat. It's not very long. So, you guys run a lot of SA lines. Yep. And you mentioned that that intermediate behind there. And for a while, SA was making the 30 cold, I believe, which had an intermediate behind it. But now you're probably going to that Titan line of sinking lines that's a full sink. Is that right? Or um, I'm not running a lot of full sinks because it's just a nightmare in, when you're in a boat. Um, if your line's falling off the edge of the boat and into the river, it's going to hang up on stuff a lot more and you're, you're going to lose rods. You're going to lose flies and a lot of gear and time and frustration just trying to maintain it. So having some portion of that line that floats, you know, is, is good because you don't have to deal with that issue, but I will always run that 30 foot sink, sink tip length over 25. I don't care what what size of stream I'm in. And the reason is I'm getting five feet more of line that's sinking to the level that I want it at, right? That's one, two more strips where I'm keeping that fly in that strike zone that I want to fish. So um, the other other advantage that you get with that longer sink tip is it allows you to fish a bigger fly. Um, You know, a lot of people, I don't think, look at line selection and rod selection really is to like what am i fishing it's more like what am i fishing for so you know, there's a lot of people are shocked when they show up and we go mouse and i'm fishing an eight weight there's a reason a i don't want to get beat and b i want to be able to deliver that fly accurately and easily in the dark without a lot of effort and an eight weight does the job way better than a seven you know i'm not going to say that we lost a fish this summer because it was on a seven weight but, but we, you'll hint we at definitely it. got beat by a fish that we should. I don't know if we well, should. Well, the got water it. temperatures are, are but, of, you know, yep. conditions where you want to land that fish quickly. That but, too. You know, we, yep. we get that question like, guys will come in here and buy 5X, t- you know, oh, yeah. leaders during hex time. Like, what are you doing with this? Oh, hex fishing. Like, no. no. Like, don't. No. Like, OX, you don't 1X. Yeah. You know, think about, you know, like one, the size fly you're throw, throwing, you know, casting the rule of three. Turn that over. Yeah, you got to turn that over. Right? You got to turn it over. We've seen then, some straight tippet we've seen, leaders. Like we've seen eight some feet crazy of straight stuff. Four x for hex. But it's like, dude, put that fish in the net. Like, yeah. don't, don't hook it, land it, hook it, set it free. Exactly. Get it Look, going. Get it back. When you're fishing the hex after dark, you know, uh, streamers. Same with streamers though. You, you know, you're you're fishing for trophies. Right. right? It's a trophy hunt. So 
to me, it's like, I'm not out here to fight them and enjoy the thrill of the battle. The thrill is the eat. Right. You either see it, hear it, or you feel it, right? A- after that point, it's like, all right, let's get them in and get them out. Right. And uh, like you said, water temps at that time of year, they can become stressful on fish. And you want to play them fast and quick. You can't do that on light gear. So, no, I agree with you. All right. Pull that tail out, Ed. Let's take a look. How how's our progression? All right. We're we're not doing too bad. We're not doing too badly. We got one more shank and we're on to the hook here. When you tie these Ed, at home, are you are you doing much production? Kind of just tie a bunch of tails? Do you tie a bunch of? No, you're making a face no, over there. I should have <laughs> taken a picture of my fly tying room before I left because it's it's actually quite hilarious. I don't think I've tied two of the same all all winter. Every Just single like one I've kicked, I've probably tied two dozen <laughs> changers, and all of them are different. They're different size, different colors. Um, there's definitely a couple of templates that I like. Um, you know, and I have exa- examples of them here. If we got time, I can show them. But you know, essentially, I I haven't tied two of the same yet, and by design, but. Um, you know, like I tied all these basically for this presentation and a couple of different color variations, which we can talk about. But, you know, I still haven't tied two olives, <laughs> two blacks. <laughs> right. Right. So. And winter's not over yet. Don't worry. Oh, I got to get my dry flies done. Oof. I'm, I'm moving on this week. Time to switch gears. Dream about warmer days and rising trout. Absolutely. Don't be afraid to wrap back over these um, underbodies if you need to create more space. He's getting a little bigger now.
All right. Not ready to have discussion about what to do now. All right, so we've pretty much finished the whole rear body of the fly. You can kind of see the taper out. We're well, start, right. starting to get there, right? So it'll take probably everybody a little time to kind of get it by eyeballing. But like I said, you can cheat if you want to. Um, biggest thing is just remember that each time you go forward, everything's got to kind of grow into the back into the back shank. Don't cover it all, but at least try and get it to extend three quarters of the way back in there. All right, so for the hook, this is just a single hook fly. We're gonna use the uh, Arex Trout Predator Lite. This is the TP605. Um, there's a standard version and then there's a light wire version. Uh, this light wire version is very sticky. Um, you can you can run the standard if you want. It's not a big deal, but you know I'm not too worried about this failing even on a larger fish. But I want to make sure that I sink that hook home. So. one of those out and then we're going to add a 3 16th inch cone for weight you can go bigger if you want to I'll tie these and weighted with a couple different sizes all right and then I had one more 8 mil shank here you could use wire for this step but there's really no reason to. We're just gonna use another shank to connect this to the hook. There's no hook back here. It's not gonna fail on you. And it'll, re it'll reduce the amount of bulk we get on the hook shank too, so. start our thread on the hook here you want to get a pretty good thread base going all right now we're going to grab that shank and just lay it right up on the side here thread. I have a feeling I got to burn this bobbin somewhere. We get questions about why threads break all the time. Well, I'm not doing a very good job of doing that. that no, it happens. It happens. <laughs> it does happen. You can nick, nick the hook point. You can spur inside the tip of this thing. Absolutely. Well, I think some people are just a little bit more heavy handed than they realize probably. Too. Oh yeah, it doesn't take much. But you can see that's that's not going anywhere. If you're really worried about it, you can put some glue on there, but I'm not worried about it. I even do this with the bigger musky flies. Until one fails, I will continue to do it that way. <laughs> Saves a lot of time. All right. So we're going to kind of repeat this process one more time here. I'm going to try and get three or four turns with the filler.
go on top again. Two more feathers here. I'm gonna go pretty high up on this neck now. Because I wanna I wanna make sure that I have enough length for these to extend back a little bit. So I'm going to use the eye of the shank here that I tied in as a connection. It's kind of like my marker where to stop for this. The cone's not going to go past it anyway, right? So I want to make sure I have enough material in here. Fill that gap. What I will do right here is put just a little bit of glue, make sure that these threads don't come undone. And we're just going to give it one or two whip finishes here, cut our thread, and push that cone right back. You can see that snugs up there nice and tight. You could put the cone in the front of this fly if you want to. I prefer the to hide it in the fly. And we're gonna do one more. grouping of filler, marabou, and feather, and then we'll finish it with a brush in the front. So my first couple wraps, I'm going really tight here to try and lock that cone in. more clump of marabou.
we did have a question yep. uh, from, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh. Of course, I started scrolling before. Anyways, someone was asking about your retrieval method with something like this. And we touched on that a little bit about not over retrieving these flies, not the not the two handed burn. That's not what these are for. No, um, you you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not the action we're looking for, right? So what specifically is the question again, Matt? Oh just what's your what's your you know if you, I'll rephrase it what's your retrieve rate or, or uh, style you're going to start with? How about that? And your progression with how you change it. I know that, of course, probably depends on depth and water temperature and a bunch of things. But Yep. So a lot of times when I'm fishing streamers in the spring, um, depending on where I am on the Manistee, I'm fishing a lot of structure, right? So brown trout tend to be ambush predators. They'll lie in wait somewhere. Um, one thing I find pretty effective with, especially this style of fly, or lamp, the, when the lampreys really get active, is when you come up on structure, especially if it's submerged or sunken in the in the actual river channel, let that thing fall right on the backside. Like as soon as you pull it over, let it go to a stall and drop. And I can almost guarantee you that nine out of 10 times, or one out of 10 times, you're gonna have a fish come peeling off that wood on the next strip and just assassinate it. Um, they they see this thing fall and it's almost like a trigger in their mind, like, oh, he's coming to get me, right? I've seen more fish come around a log over the top and chase these things down like five feet and then kill it. So one thing I do a lot when I'm fishing structure is I let my flies kind of linger in that zone longer. I'm not in a hurry to get it out of there, right? So I'm gonna fish to it, I'm gonna let it fall, boop, boop, couple of little pops maybe or a slow strip and get it to swim to another pause, let it fall. I'm going to take my time around that structure. And I think the number one mistake that I see a lot of people make is when they get to the edge of the run where you see the, the color change, we call it, right, where the depth change occurs, is they pull it out before they fish it out onto the shallow. It's like, no, man, keep it coming, keep it coming. Right to your rod tip if you have to. Uh, I see a lot of fish come late. 10 feet from behind the fly, just screaming across the shallow bar. It's like, well, why, why now? Once you right. hit that light line, dark line, so many times that's when you get the eat. Yeah. How many times have you had eats where you go to roll cast your fly back out or you go to pick it up and you're like, oh, man, one more strip. Right. I right? just took it away from that. <laughs> oh, fish. did you see that? You did. <laughs> right. So, um, but I vary my retrieve a lot. Like, I'll play with it over the course of the day or have my customers play with it over the course of the day. You know, I'll go a little faster, a little slower. But for me, I think. You know, just kind of like a like a lazy, arrhythmic kind of little jig, little dart, little speed. Fish it slow, fish it fast, you know, change it up. Uh, very rarely will I fish the same retrieve, the same speed, the same way all the way back to the boat. Unless something's not working and I'm just trying to find something. Or if the fish are really fired up, maybe I'm trying to fish a little faster to get them just to trigger, right? So... There's really no right or wrong answer, but I think you have to be, like I said, you know, be plastic in how you fish it. So, all right, well, we're going to finish the head on this, and we can talk about other stuff. So uh, I'm going to use a Senyo Chromatic 1.5-inch wide brush. This happens to be the Pale Bronze. Um, for me, it's I like this color. In a lot of our water, it looks really good, and especially on an olive fly, tan fly. Um, this color scheme really seems to pop. So we're just going to tie this in here. It's a little long. Buying a good pair of wire cutters, save your scissors too, when you're tying with these brushes. So All right, we're just going to tie that right up. Oh. Against those feathers, and I want to get as many turns with this brush as I can because it's not really dense, but I want to build up some bulk in the front of this fly. And just kind of watch your brush as you turn if you're starting to see stuff getting 
kind of tucked under itself. You can pick it out with a brush or your backing. Take the time to do it now, make it a little less laborsome later. I noticed that was one thing, Ed, that uh, when you were when we were fishing with you in the fall, where you were actually carrying a brush with you. Yeah, I really. And a lot of saltwater guides do that uh, when you're using yep. synthetics. Yeah, I mean, you get, you know, pike and musky are really slimy, right? And as soon as they tackle one of those flies, you know, if you let that fly dry in that state, you're probably going to have a hard time getting it to look right again. So, yeah, combing it out really makes a difference. You know, and that's the other part of these, too, is you want that water to flow over the material. And if it's not, you know, like the straighter fibers, it flows better, right? So Blaine talked about this when I fished with him. And he said, you know, the stiffer fibers, the straighter fibers, you get better water flow over, which makes it swim better. And if you can keep your fly designed with that concept, then you're going to get more movement in the back end, right? So building bulk in the front allows the water to kind of churn up the back, which gets us moving more. But anyway, if if you do catch pike and muskie on any fly, it, you know, they're going to be short-lived. But with these synthetics, you can get in there and just pick at it. There's really nothing wrong with that. Try to get one more turn in here. But whenever you're working with these brushes, you're gonna you're gonna get the material kind of getting stuck under itself, so to speak. Just take a second, pick at it a little bit. After I cut that wire, I just kind of take my thumbnail, get in there, and push it down a little bit. That's Don't a great go. idea to tie everything off, trim your thread, and then trim the wire off. I see it too many times the other yeah. the other way. So I'm just going to pick at this for a second and try and get as much of that material flare as I can because I want some bulk up here. And you can trim it up if you want to. You can leave it as is. Knowing Johnny Ray, he would tell me right now to just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't, so I'm going to pick a few of these longer hairs out. Just kind of keep that taper. It's probably him texting me now. <laughs> and then you can take, you know, your scissors if you want to and shape it. There's a lot of other brushes that you can use where you can get a lot more um, shape where the fly will actually hold it. Good enough. And it, and you should always blow on your changers when you're done. Because <laughs> then you can see how it flows. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. But anyway, so it's a pretty lengthy tie, but you know what? I don't care. I mean, for me, it's like they're fun to fish. They're fun to tie. If you don't mind spending the time on them. I, I mean, a lot of the stuff I tie for muskies, I takes me an easy hour if not longer if there's you any said, trimming involved it's it's eating up your clock yeah you said so. you know some of those flies we were fishing this yeah. fall you're a couple hours yeah easy and like I, you know i'm not tying for production i'm not selling the stuff so but you're not losing it no whole pile of them no either, these flies so. are super durable yeah you know and especially when you start dealing with the full synthetic stuff i mean um the only fish that i have actually fished for that was very destructive on synthetics was the golden dorado um we had you know kind of a cool situation at the lodge we were fishing at where they had fly tying vices and materials and we brought or knowing that ahead of time we brought our own materials to tie down there and so it was kind of cool you know because the guides would come in and start tying with you after day two They're like oh what are you guys doing in here so john and i kind of laughed because a lot of the flies that we started fishing with only had like six seven eight strands of flash in them yeah, we're showing up with our, you know, Buford musky flies with, you know, Kevin Feenstra level flash to it. And right. uh, they're like, oh, wow. Next thing you know, as the week's progressing, 
we're seeing the flash count increase in their flies and it's like man that's awesome we kind of had an imprint you know on their fishery i like it right and uh you know i still keep in touch with one of the guys that we fish with down there and i've been watching his fly design over the last year and a half and yeah it's it's cool watching the how it all changes so um but yeah that you know the game changers work really well down there um you know some of the bigger synthetics we start tying it in that eight, nine, ten, twelve inch range. It, it can wear on you as the day goes on, but it's all right. Well, thanks for doing this. Hey, you're welcome. Hold up some of the other uh, yeah. So flies. You know, here's you talk about those. Some of the other color options that you know, you, like I said, the the schemes are endless. You know, yellow is a good combination. White. I happen to do this one, white and black, but like white and olive would be great. Um, you know, black. Kind of hard to beat black. <laughs> if it's slow just fish black um you know here's like a more natural tan but you Ooh, know I like, that. Ooh, I like that i like that yeah oh yeah yeah this one this one's sexy <laughs> <laughs> um you know and then some of the other stuff that you can do you know like these are all feather change this is a feather changer here i'm using a different brush underneath and in the head but you know these things are super light they move really well they fish well easy to cast this one's all synthetic uh, except for the tail and the and the wings right so uh, let's see there's a lot here here's you a, guys are missing this whole table full of these. yeah <laughs> so like i said i haven't tied one the same yet sure <laughs> we'll get some pictures of these yeah. and post yeah. it with so the this yeah. this tail here is actually different so like you know like i said the options are endless this is that new galaxy mop tail from hairline and I tell you what, that thing moves as good as a rabbit. I was quite impressed when I put it in the water for the first time. Um, I saw Blaine had a few with that mop tail. I was like, yeah, I'll try it, right? And I fished it, and it totally blew my mind. I was like, whoa. So yeah. you can tell us when you're buying mop material, it's, it's for all your game changers, not for your mop flies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can feel good about it. <laughs> you know how I many nymphs I have in my bag? <laughs> not many. I didn't see any coming in. From yeah, no, not any. And then, you know, the other thing, too, is, you know, OG Circus Peanut, um, rubber legs. You know, this is a great variation. Same concept, right? Add some weight to it with those rubber yep. legs. So it's it's keeled, you know, all the all these flies. If you don't keel them, you know, it's totally your choice. I want my flies to run true when they're coming in. I don't want a whole lot of side action. I want it to stay like this. It allows more versatility in your retrieve. Plus, it allows you to get deeper, right? So, and it's easier to cast. We start casting at distance, turn that fly over at 60, 70 feet. Not that we really have to throw it that far, but we have a few tail waters where we can let it rip. Sure. And it won't turn over unless it's weighted. So. And we talked about some great resources out there for those of you who are looking to start tying game changers. Number one has to be probably Blaine's book. Oh, yeah. Game oh, yeah. There's a lot of. Like I said, you're not going to read it once and no. get it's, everything from it's it. A yeah, it's a reference book. You're going to keep sold coming back to it. Every copy, and we just got a new shipment in. Yeah, so, so those are available on our website, thenorthernangler.com. We'll put a link down below and in the materials list with Ed. And then we just got these in from the Flyman Company, which is the same company who does the shanks. And it's a really good way to get. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. <laughs> The game changer show and tell game changer kit so this kit comes with everything you need to tie three different colorways of the game changer this is a finesse and then there's also a micro i believe is it the micro i can't see anything mini mini, mini. finesse changer so those are available online as well and then a good way to get started if you're if you want to do what ed's doing here with the micro shanks you can buy the micro shanks or you can buy this uh Starter pack. The starter pack, which has all the relevant shanks all ready to rock right in there, including a tail shank. So we didn't do that. We just improvised with a yeah. A the standard. tail shanks, I didn't. I didn't like them with the marabou. I, I right. couldn't get the thread tension enough to get the material to bite on there, and it, it'd spin off. But it's a great option for feathers. Um, even that mop tail would be easy to tie onto it. But I use a lot, like some of these. I use the tail shank pack here. Just easier to tie on than those 10, ten millimeter clunky right. short shanks. Right. 
Any other references that you'd recommend for folks or uh, tips? For I mean, there's a ton of stuff these? online. There's a lot of guys that really took off with it in the last few years. You know, obviously Blaine's the pioneer on that whole platform. But yeah, um, you know, there's no limit to what you can do with it. It's kind of fun to play around with. That's what's so fun about there's no stuff right or like wrong this. Way. People come up with something and they say, "Here, run with it. Yeah. You do you." You know, we we're starting to see more trout size stuff than. Than anything else, you know, when it started, they were a lot bigger, it feels like. And yeah, well, I think hit for him, it was the same thing that kind of got need. me intrigued with it was the aspect for muskies, right? Yeah, I mean, because when we, we went, you showed me like this thing. So, we talked about it. I fish a lot of like what <laughs> Tommy and I tie are these flashy, slim flies yeah. that are very visual. They catch flies, fish. push water, they make noise, yeah. and you can just tailor it to your needs, which is so yep. cool about this platform. So. Yep, and you know when it's boat side on that figure eight, you can't beat that. It looks like a real fish swimming right there under your rod tip. Yeah, and it's a selling point for that fish. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it got me a few times. Figure eight. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's the fly. That's... Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then oh. you see that come up, and you know, like there it is. Yep. yep. Just keep turning, turning that figure eight. I will get a trout on figure eight this year. That's my goal. <laughs> I've got them on, I've gotten them think, on J turns. Yep, I'm telling you, I think <laughs> I think that if you had the proper position on that fish, a figure eight yep. for the trout would totally make a big. Got to read the fish. If he's coming exactly. hot, don't stop moving it. Keep it going. Keep it going. But Never when they stop. start to drift off, I think you can yep. get their attention with that eight. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to play with it. Change the direction. Maybe we can get out, fish for fun. Yeah. <laughs> Sooner than later, I hope. <laughs> right. Hopefully we this break polar through vortex this. Yeah. sucks. It's it does. Let's be realistic. It's painful. All right. I think we've answered pretty much everyone's questions from tonight. Uh, tons of awesome questions. Great to see everyone every week uh, in the in the chat room here and tuning in with us live Absolutely. at the Northern Thank Angler. So we really really appreciate the support. Uh, a few things to hammer home real quick. One, how do we get in touch with Ed, and uh, how do they you know get in touch with you uh well you can go to mangofly.com and just send an email straight to the company um you can essentially reach out to you guys i don't have a problem with that absolutely um, i'll call a shop here and you can find me on facebook at ed mccoy um or on instagram at captain ed mccoy so fantastic awesome. well thanks a lot ed yeah no, we you're really, welcome. thanks for having me really appreciate it. if you haven't done so think about hitting the subscribe button if you're new to our channel and the notification bell that lets you know when we have new videos just a reminder you can go back and watch this all you want you can skip it's through our, you can our fast forward yeah, through you the can, last you can up three up six millimeter shanks <laughs> and get right to the hook <laughs> but there's a lot of great content yeah in all of our there videos, is and we're having is. fun doing it so. and, and we we do pay attention to the comments so if you've if you're watching this later on and you have a question ask us we'll get yep. in touch with ed we'll ask um next week uh brian's gone he's uh gonna be out getting a tan down in mexico yeah. uh we'll have our friend of the shop john ingham here is going to be tying steelhead tubes which i'm pretty excited about we've had a lot of questions about and he's got at least two really good basic flies that you can build off of for pretty much any situation swinging John's flies. been doing our tube classes forever. Um, Long time. Big spay guy, so we're really looking forward to having John I'm, here. I'm excited about that. And we'll have the materials list up soon. I, I probably have forgotten to do that, let's be honest. And then uh, I'll see if I can find a mystery guest host. Never know. Ooh. It's, it's fun to have an extra, extra person here. The color commentary. Right? That's good. Absolutely. All well, right, thanks, everybody. Everyone. Thanks, everybody. Be well. Hope to see you all very soon in the shop or out on the water. Cheers. Thanks again.